When I was around eight, nine, ten years old, something about that age range, my parents were given a recording of a Northern Irish pastor who was talking about the subject of backmasking. Now, it's the idea that hidden messages can be recorded onto songs, but you can only hear those messages if you play the song backwards. They're either put there deliberately by the band themselves or the message from this pastor was that demons can insert messages into songs without the artist even being aware. And then without realizing it, these hidden messages are then being absorbed by by the listeners and subliminally understood by their subconscious, which then affects their thoughts and ultimately their actions. I don't know what I think about it these days, to be honest, but all I know is that when I was 10 years old, this recording was one of the scariest things I'd ever heard in my life. And it left such an indelible mark in me. I think music played backwards in general is an inherently disorientating thing. There's a haunting element to it. The noise is discordant and it's loud when you don't expect it to be and it's soft when you don't expect it to be. The sound of the vocals backwards is kind of alien and otherworldly and I don't know what causes this. I think it might be the cymbals, but there's this noise that kind of goes throughout the song and that itself is quite haunting. And it left such a mark on me that I still remember the songs that were highlighted in this audio. So there was Stairway to Heaven by Led Zeppelin. There was Under Pressure by David Bowie and Queen. There was The Locomotion by Kylie Minogue as well, which I think was quite a strange one at the time. And I still remember the horrifying messages that were being highlighted through these songs. And they came through in a raspy or kind of scary whispering voice. The pastor would tell you what to listen out for and then he would press play in the song and then you would hear it. And it would just absolutely terrify me as a 10 year old kid. From then on, I held to this belief that all secular rock music was essentially the devil's music. It was deliberately being created with the aid of dark powers to lead people into evil, darkness, rebellion. It existed to subvert and break and destroy and it was fueled by anger and ugliness and rage and destruction and all of those things. That was my belief about all secular rock music at that time. And I held to that view for quite a few years until around the age of 14 when all of my friends suddenly started getting into music. And amongst my own group of school friends in particular, there was a bit of a scene happening at the time. They were into British guitar bands like Oasis, Ash and the Stone Roses. And there was such a lot of talk about these bands and how amazing their music was and it was just the best thing that you've ever heard that I've got to admit that at that time I was beginning to feel quite intrigued by it and I decided I would go out and I'd pick up a copy of What's the Story Morning Glory by Oasis. Now this was back in the days of CDs, back in that prehistoric age when you actually had to go out and buy the CD and take it home. So that's what I did and I remember sitting down and putting my earphones in and putting the CD into the player and feeling a genuine sense of trepidation about what was about to happen. What was I gonna hear when I pressed that play button? What ugly, rage-filled, soul-polluting, back-masked, evil, destructive, rebellious noise was gonna come through those earphones? Well, I pressed play and I braced myself and I was prepared to immediately take them out and take the CD out and throw it away because of what might happen when I pressed that play button. But what I heard that day really surprised me because it wasn't that. There was a beauty in the music, an unexpected beauty, I've got to say. I mean, even the rockier songs had a kind of melody to them, but it was the softer songs that really gripped me because I didn't think that vulnerable soft songs even existed in the genre. Songs like Wonderwall had a vulnerability and songs like Don't Look Back in Anger, the message of that song was in rage. It was saying, don't become angry and don't hold on to grudges and don't become bitter. I was shocked by that message. I genuinely was, I just couldn't believe it. Where was the rage? Where was the ugliness? I especially remember being enchanted by Cast No Shadow because again, it was soft, it was melodic, there were harmonies in the song. And it seemed to me that they were genuinely trying to create beauty. And then the beginning of Champagne Supernova started with the sound of waves gently lapping on the shore and it felt peaceful and calming, not dark. And this just was not what I'd expected at all. I was intoxicated by this. I had this kind of preconception that it would be all about ugliness and destruction and subversion and rage. And yet here I was intoxicated by melody and by harmony. Now from there, Oasis kept on referencing the Beatles as being their favorite band. And therefore me and my friends really got into the Beatles. In fact, they quickly became my all time favorite band, hands down, no contest. I just couldn't believe 
how imaginative and diverse and melodic and interesting their songs were. I thought they were geniuses. I was a Beatles fanatic. In fact, every time I saved up £10, I just had one thought in my mind, and that was to buy another Beatles album. And I would plan it in advance. You know, which one will I get next? Rubber Soul or Abbey Road? Then from there, I decided to explore the rest of the 60s. So I got into the Kinks, the Beach Boys, Simon and Garfunkel, Bob Dylan. Then from there, I decided to go through the rest of the decades. So I went through the 70s, 80s, 90s, back into the 2000s, again, to see what else I could find from all of those eras. I just hoovered up music. It was around then that I discovered the Stone Roses debut album and I fell in love with it from the end of the 80s. Again, it was probably my favourite album of all time because of the melodies and the soaring choruses and the beauty. Then from there, I got into the Red Hot Chili Peppers and what I'm just really trying to say is that I was a music nut. I think for teenagers, you're looking for someone who understands when perhaps you don't always feel understood. And music can provide that feeling that someone out there genuinely empathizes with your pain and the intensity of your emotions and your sadness and your teenage heartbreak, most likely. So as I reached the end of my teenage years as this music fanatic, I'd basically come to this conclusion that there was a dark end of the music industry and there were bands and artists that I wouldn't touch. So I always stayed away from the overtly dark music like Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath, Marilyn Manson, Nirvana, and even stuff like Eminem. It just seemed like rage and bile spewed from Eminem's mouth. So I stayed away from all of that, but I figured there was an okay sphere of the secular music industry that was basically fine. And that was the bigger part of it. People trying to create beauty. Now that being said, over the years as a Christian, I have to admit that my conscience was sometimes bothered by the content of what I was listening to within this so-called acceptable sphere of Christian music as I saw it. I may have initially enjoyed the beauty and the softer side of things on What's the Story Morning Glory, but on that same album, there are songs that celebrate the taking of drugs. That bothered my conscience as a Christian. Oasis also sang condescendingly about making God cry. They sang, I met my maker, made him cry. And on my shoulder, he asked me why. His people won't fly through the storm. I said, listen up, man, they don't even know you're born. So it's reducing God to a pitiful figure who cries on the shoulder of Oasis and who needs Oasis to tell him how it is in life. It bothered my conscience. As much as I loved the Beatles, elements of their songs pricked my conscience. Their dabbling in Eastern mysticism and the way that crept into some of their music. The fact they had Alistair Crowley as a celebrated figure on the front of Sgt. Pepper. The Stone Roses debut album, as much as I loved that album, it opened with a track called I Wanna Be Adored. And the lyrics are so dark, I don't even want to say them or put them up on the screen. But basically, it's about the singer selling his soul to the devil. The final song on that same album is called I Am The Resurrection. And Ian Brown sings about himself quite blasphemously, saying I and the resurrection and the life, taking the place of Jesus. That made me very uncomfortable as a Christian. There was something explicitly sinister at times about Ash as well, in their imagery and in their lyrics. They sang pridefully, I won't confess my transgressions, I won't repent my vice, I won't be saved. Red Hot Chili Peppers sang a song about drugs, in fact, many songs about drugs. They had an album called Blood Sugar Sex Magic, Magic with a K, references the occult. All of this bothered my conscience as a Christian and made me uncomfortable. And yet, I loved this music so much that I ignored my conscience in those moments. I would simply skip or mute the dark bits because I didn't want to give all this up. This music just meant far too much to me and I didn't want to let it go. Now, because I didn't listen to my conscience about this stuff, I also have to admit that my conscience therefore became numbed because that's what happens. If you keep ignoring your conscience, it becomes seared, it becomes numbed. That's what the Bible says. And I found that throughout the years, the boundaries of what I considered acceptable began shifting very gradually, almost imperceptibly, by very small degrees. I was willing to go a little bit darker and a little bit darker and a little bit harder. And I think the nadir really happened when I bought Nirvana's best of album. Now I had Nirvana alongside Black Sabbath and Led Zeppelin and all of those bands that I would previously never have considered, but for some reason that I still don't really understand, I bought this album. And on it was a song about rape. 
And that was the moment when I really caught myself and I kind of came to my senses and I thought, what are you doing here? What are you listening to here? You're filling your mind and your soul with utter garbage here. The Bible says, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. And here I was sitting with a Nirvana album where Kurt Cobain sings about rape. And on my wall, I had all of these other CDs with other songs about sex and drugs and blasphemy and the occult. And I decided at that point, I needed to make a decision about who I was and who I wanted to be in life. I thought I can't go to church and call myself a Christian and sing songs of worship and praise to Jesus and tell him that he's everything to me and then come home and play this music about sex, drugs, the occult, Satan, and lyrics that blaspheme God's name and that are antithetical to everything I believe in. That is completely hypocritical. You've got to decide who you are in life, what you stand for, and what path you want to take in life. You have to decide what's more important to you because you can't in good conscience have both of these things. It's either Jesus or it's this music, but you can't worship him in one moment and then sing along to these songs in the next moment. As James said about the tongue, my brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? So I was at a fork in the road here. I had a choice to make. In the end, it wasn't the parts of the music that I couldn't hear that led me to this fork, namely the back masking. It was the parts that I could understand. As Mark Twain said, it ain't the parts of the Bible I don't understand that bother me, it's the parts I do understand. And it was like that with music. I mean, forget about what happens when songs are played backwards. I had a choice to make about what I was absorbing when they were played forwards. That was the main thing here. Was this music true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, and admirable? Because if not, I had a choice to make. Was it going to be Jesus or this music? And on that cliffhanger, I'll pick up the story in the next video because I wanna go somewhere with this.